Good afternoon and welcome to the DEY 5th Annual Summer Institute. My name is Denisha Jones and I currently serve as the Executive Director for Defending the Early Years and your Summer Institute Moderator. The DEY Summer Institute is an annual event that brings together early childhood educators and advocates from across the country to develop a thoughtful and dynamic grassroots advocacy platform and action steps that support the whole child, respect child development, and recognize the importance of play so that all children may experience a just and equitable education, quality education and future. This year's theme is what works, learning from early childhood educators, advocates, and researchers. Though we often spend a lot of time discussing the challenges and issues we face in the field of early childhood education and care. This year, we seek to shift the discussion to examine what works, what has worked, and what is working. We want to acknowledge the people, actions, and practices that get us closer to ensuring all children have a just and equitable early childhood education. We recognize the challenges and we'll continue strategizing on how best to overcome them. But after five years, we believe it's time to focus on the solutions. How are educators engaging in best practices to support young children and their families? What wins have advocates made to improve systems of early care and education? How can the latest research have, how can the latest research have a positive impact on our practices? We invite you to join us as we highlight a few examples of what works in early childhood education and care. We kick off the Institute with a focus on strategies for early childhood advocacy. We then transition to a panel discussion on three recent early childhood policy successes. Tomorrow, we honor the voices of early childhood educators, caregivers, and advocates who seek to, tireless, uh, to work tirelessly to center children's needs despite the attacks on racial and gender justice and those who seek to limit children's freedom. On Wednesday, we conclude with a research in the practice session that features highlights from a recent book on childcare justice, a study on children's agency in the early years, and an overview of how a decrease in children's independent activity can lead to a decrease in children's well being. Though we recognize that two hours will only give us enough time to scratch the surface each day. We hope these conversations will inspire you to continue working for a just and equitable childhood for all children. Now for some logistics. We are recording the webinar each day and we'll send a copy of the recording to everyone who is registered. We are also streaming live to our Facebook page. If you would like a certificate of attendance, please complete the form included in your daily email by Friday, June 30th. You only need to submit it once for all three sessions and we will email certificates. The link will be shared on the final day in the chat. At the end will be time for Q&A. Please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. It's on the bottom of your screen and it says Q&A. Please do not submit questions for the Q&A in the chat. We encourage you to dialogue with each other in the chat, but place your questions in the Q&A. You'll also see that you can vote, uh, upvote a question. As you know, we won't get to all of our questions. So if you see a question and you really like it, vote for it. And the questions that are uh, with the most votes will be the first questions that we begin with in our short time for the Q&A. We encourage you to use the chat to introduce yourself to uh, your fellow participants and to the panelists, um, and also to have rich discussions. Uh, we know that people like to put resources in the chat and we'll be putting resources in the chat. So we're going to collect everything shared in the chat and we're going to send um, a link to all the resource documents in our daily email tomorrow, again, to everyone who is registered. So please take advantage of the chat and to talk with each other. Great, now for the main event. Day one of the 2023 Summer Institute begins with strategies for early childhood advocacy, a conversation with Valora Washington. Dr. Valora Washington is an internationally recognized authority in early childhood education. She is known for conceptualizing, leading, and ex executing significant change initiatives impact impacting policy programs and practices in higher education, philanthropy, and national nonprofits, as well as in local, state, and federal government programs. 
We invite you to read her full bio that I am going to drop <laughs> into the chat right now. Um, and also note that she is currently the chief executive officer of the uh, Kale Institute, um, which we'll be sharing more resources from them as well, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us, mm -hmm. Valora. My pleasure. Great. Thank you. Now, let me, here we go. Okay, I'm going to share the rest of this in the chat because your bio is outstanding and I just don't have time to read it all. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to go ahead and introduce our co-discussant today, um, Nancy Carlson Page. Dr. Nancy Carlson Page is a professor emerita, um, emerita at Leslie University, where she was a teacher, educator, and child development for more than 30 years. In 2012, she co-founded Defending the Early Years with Diane Levin and currently serves as president of the board. I will also add more of her bio to the chat in just a second. Thank you for joining us, Nancy. Oh, thanks, Denisha. It's great to be here. Valora, I'm so, I'm delighted you're with us. Um, we're really lucky to have you. It's a great pleasure. I'm so admiring of the work that you've done over so many years and really appreciate what Defending the Early Years is working to achieve. Uh, that's really wonderful to hear. Um, welcome also to everybody else who's participating. And I've recently been learning about the Kale Institute and the amazing work you all are doing. So uh -huh. I look forward to hearing more about that and getting to know your um your institution better. It's we have a lot of overlap, clearly. Yeah, um, yeah we so we have some questions for you. So I'm going to start right off uh, with the first one, um, which is, uh, what do you think about the impact that COVID-19 had on the early childhood field and particularly the, the policy landscape, both positive and negative? Okay, that is, I would think, a really interesting question, and it would be very difficult to overestimate or overstate the negative impact that COVID had on early childhood education and on early childhood educators. But I think it's really important to start off by recognizing that COVID really just highlighted all of the challenges that we've been facing some time, numerous challenges, significant challenges, well-known challenges, the fragmentation of the field, the unaligned regulatory systems that we have, the workplace shortages, the business models that cannot support the workforce either financially or um, offer living wages. So COVID really highlighted a lot of these issues. And what we saw during COVID was a lot of the workforce and people in the field coming together to seek solutions and to really begin to think differently about how we could really work in this field. So now we're in a point where we're really trying to focus on COVID's um, stabilization of the field, recovery of the field, and growth of the field. And there's a lot of things that we have to think about when we think about that. First of all, we have to realize that one of the things that happened in COVID is people really stop talking a lot about school readiness or developing the whole child. And they really start defining our purpose as providing a place for kids to be while their parents worked. I think we should be very concerned about that. Obviously, we do provide a place for kids to be when their parents work. That is not the primary purpose of our profession. So I think COVID really shifted that thought about who we are and what we do to something that was really custodial, and we really need to uh, challenge that. I think there's been, during COVID, a lot of historic levels of financial support that came to the field. Major governmental investments came into child care. And this is very similar to something we've seen in the past. I mean, if you go back to World War II, we see with the Lanham Act, because it was an emergency, the government put a lot of money into early childhood education. But then what happened after the war ended was that money was withdrawn. And so as we think about what we're gonna be doing as child advocates and as people who care about children and families now, is we really need to make sure that this doesn't happen again and that a lot of the investments that started can be continued because despite how horrible COVID was for our field, there were some good things that came out of COVID for us as well. Thank you so much for sharing that, Valora. Yeah, I think it's important to contextualize all of the impact that COVID has had, the shift in how we think about care and education. And, and yeah, people realize that 
Parents need child care to go to work, but there are benefits of child care in addition to um, providing a safe environment for children to go to be in when adults are, are not home. But what else can we be getting out of our investment in child care? What else Absolutely. should we be entering in our mm -hmm. investment in child care, right? And, and that these two things are important, but one can't be more important than the other, right? And that's super important. So when we read your article, which we're going to drop in the chat in the child care exchange, <laughs> we had to have you on uh, as a guest today. It was really well done. Um, you talked about strategies around and, um, early childhood advocacy. So why do you believe we need to focus on next level strategies as ECE policy advocates? Well, I think one of the things that happened was, and I think I really want to point out that under COVID, many things happened that we need to see continue. So for example, we saw a lot of facility improvements. We saw a lot of technology integrations. We saw program expansions in some levels. We saw that child poverty decreased. Also, despite how hard COVID was, particularly on Black and Latino communities, at the same time, we also saw these declines in child poverty. We saw the number of uninsured Americans go down. And what we see now is that because all of this funding is scheduled to end in September 2024, we're going to face a fiscal cliff. And that means that a lot of this money is going to disappear unless action is taken. We're also seeing a number of states taking action. So what do we need to do as next level advocacy, advocacy strategies? What actions can we take? And I think there's a number of things that we need to take. One, we need to go back to basics and think about our purpose. As I mentioned earlier, what are we trying to accomplish and for whom? We need to think about how we can really pull our field more together to have really aligned services. We still have not done this. This is still very aspirational for us. And it's something that we need to continue to try to do. We need to reframe the way people are talking about the workforce. Right now, a lot of the focus is on the so-called workforce shortages, which is very, very real. There are programs everywhere that are closed in empty classrooms because they don't have the staff. But I think we need to reframe the conversation to think about how we can make early childhood jobs, better jobs, how we can make the jobs better for the people who are work at, working in them, making the jobs better. Compensation obviously is a huge part of that, but there's more to it than just compensation. We need to be thinking about the working conditions that many people have um, and other kinds of frameworks. We need to figure out as next level strategies, how we can retain some of the great things that happened under COVID, what we found was all of a sudden the government can make policy changes very, very rapidly to get people to work, to serve children. How do we sustain a lot of that? So I think our next level strategies really need to focus on sustaining some of the policy gains that we made at state and local levels so that we can better serve children. And that's what I think we need to be focused on a lot. Thank you. We're going to talk about some of those policy gains specific to local areas, but as ideas for what can be done when people collaborate, work together and pursue um, and pursue these, these different types of initiatives and wins yeah. for that. Well, Laura, mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts personally about this? These are really profound ideas. First of all, our purpose that we We've struggled for a long time, some of us who've been in the field for decades, with communicating uh, what is the purpose of early childhood education and how we see it as a professional field and how it's so needed. And there's so much important research showing the value to society when it, it does happen. And um, and as you, it's critical what you said, I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. When, when we need it, uh, somehow the policy change happens, but it's short term. And I, I'm just wondering if you have thoughts. I'm, I struggle with this and I don't have an answer, but you know, how do we convey the absolute critical essential nature of, of quality early childhood education accessible to everyone. Absolutely. And not only that, in my point of view, tuition free, accessible, developmentally Absolutely. appropriate, culturally sensitive, all of those things. So, oh, yeah. you know, these these fragmented things that happened in terms of, you know, all of a sudden many 
communities were able to enroll children and pay providers based on enrollment rather than attendance. So these are major policy shifts that literally happened overnight that have a huge financial impact on programs. Now, not to ever underestimate how devastating COVID was. 16,000 programs closed permanently. Um, and if this fiscal cliff goes into effect, it is going to be quite devastating for all of us in the field. But I do think we need to look strategically at some of the policy changes that happened and figure out how we can turn these changes into permanent decisions not temporary solutions for the, the early child care crisis. It was a crisis under COVID, but we have been in a crisis for a very long time before COVID. So it's really important to think about how we can turn this situation, instead of being a fiscal cliff, how we can turn it into a bridge to some, some sustainable change and some sustainable funding. Do you think, um that you you mentioned the fragmentation of the field, which is something we've you know struggled with forever. And somehow it seems to me that that fragmentation um, creates um, a situation that makes it hard for us to get a unified voice as a professional field. What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree with you. I think that aligning early childhood education as a coherent field of practice is aspirational for us. It continues to be aspirational for us. And, um, you know, we're very disturbed that Built Back Better did not pass. We're very disturbed that the Inflation Reduction Act did not include early childhood education. But one of the things that we can reflect upon is what if those things have been successful? Obviously, it would have poured a lot of money into the field, but how well we might have handled implementation is a question because of the fragmentation of the field, because we are not aligned as a coherent field of practice. So these are things that we need to think about. And if we want to be successful long term, we are really going to have to think about how we can have a more uneven, a more even level of practice and more thought about our identity, our professional identity, and our professional purpose. You know, I, I love hearing this conversation and I, you know, I think about the importance of it, of, of helping the field unify, but then I also worry about, you know, there are more than, there are different ways, right, to educate young children and different beliefs, right? And so do you think it's possible to unify the field, but also allow for those of us who believe in the power of play to pursue play as, as, a, as a pedagogy while, you know, other people have a different focus, right? I, I you know, I don't want to, I don't know how much the focus on unifying will force people to abandon different things that they believe about children if we all have to agree on the same thing, or can we all agree on the same thing, right? I, I don't know. I want to believe that we can, but I also know that people feel differently about different approaches to early childhood education, right? Like, you know, Reggio's great, Montessori's great, play, is, there's so many different things. Can we, can we unify and still have all of these diverse approaches to, to caring for young children? Do you well, think? absolutely, because I think when we talk about unifying the field of early childhood education, it is really not about having a singular type of curriculum or a singular type of approach. It's about understanding together what our primary purpose is, what the work that it is, what are the competencies that are required to be excellent in the work that we're trying to accomplish. What do we as a profession hold ourselves accountable to achieve and to do? It's about those big bucket ideas. And within that bucket, there are very many, many educational approaches and strategies that people might work in actually delivering services to young children. It's about making a decision as a nation about do we really even want to invest in young children? Because as a nation, we haven't ever decided that we want to do that, except on a short-term emergency uh, basis, so that we're still working in a nation that has historically not wanted to embrace early childhood education as a public good. We're still fighting that battle. So coming together as a coherent field of practice really is about defining big picture issues of who we are, what we do, what is our purpose, what do we want to accomplish, and what we want to be accountable for. 
Yeah, no, I think that's super important because it scares some people, right? Like someone, you know, someone put in a question about, you know, universal pre 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 uh, preschool and how do we make sure that it doesn't become this academic thing that takes away all the things we know about child development, right? So, so on one hand, we want to universify the field and we want professional standards and for everyone to agree on the importance of early childhood education and care and that investment to finally make it as a nation committed to young children, but we also um, worry that sometimes that's going to lead us down, right? Americans, we tend to have this tendency where we want everyone to be doing the same thing at the same time, right? In our public schools, right? The push for unifying the standards, you know, call, comes into question, right? And so I think it's important to talk about unifying the profession, but allowing diversity in our curriculum and in our approaches, but sharing the same end goal, which is supporting children and by extension, supporting their families, right? And that there are multiple ways to do that, but we want to embrace but we got to get on that first page, right? That that we're not all there yet as a, as a country and as a nation. And I appreciate you saying that. Um, I do want to transition to our to talk about uh, leadership. And and you've been preparing early childhood leaders. I've been preparing Nancy. Yeah. I all of us work in the field of preparing teachers, right? In different areas. You know, your work with the um, the credential, the, the Child Development Associ Association has been amazing, right? Um, so let's talk about leadership. Let's let's first talk about next level leadership and what does that mean to you and why it's important and what are some of the challenges you think around those of us doing the work and in, in, in recruiting early childhood professionals or working with those who are in the field as well too. Wow, that's a really important topic. And I think for people like Nancy and me and also Diane Levin, who's a founder of your organization as well, I mean, I think that we can feel very confident that there are a lot of, you know, younger professionals coming down the line who are deeply passionate about doing this work. And so I feel very confident when I see the younger professionals. I think as a cohort, if we want to think about them as a generation of leaders, I think that they are much more prepared, particularly in the policy space. I think that during our era, Nancy, we were really learning and trying things and making up a lot of things, you know, on the spot to try to make a difference for kids. I think that had, was very successful. But I think this new generation of early childhood leaders has had a much greater level of preparation in terms of understanding the policy landscape, understanding how to impact that landscape, and having experience trying out making those kinds of change strategies. So I feel very confident about that. I also think that this new generation of educational leaders has a much deeper sense and understanding that what we're dealing with is systems issues. I think there is still a lot of feeling of isolation out in the field, but I think there's a much broader understanding now that we're tackling a system and that it is going to require systemic change at a bigger level to get what we need. I'm very confident about that. There's also with this new generation of leaders, a lot more diversity in the kinds of employment that is available for people who have early childhood education, passion and skill and knowledge. At the same time, I think when we think about the next generation of leaders, there's a number of things that need to be accomplished that are still challenging for us. And one of those things is making sure that we are really listening to practitioners and bringing practitioner voice to the table. There's a lot more talk about bringing practitioners to the table, but I don't think that the action of actually doing it is as deep as it must be for us to affect meaningful change. I think that we also, as I mentioned earlier, need to shift the whole leadership narrative, shift that whole narrative from everything that's wrong with the field to really more positive, constructive, what are the challenges of the field, but in a way that moves beyond simple solutions like degree attainment and really think more about the competencies that people need to have, the skills that they need to have, what the system is actually doing to help people be attracted to our field, to stay in our field, to be well compensated in our field. These are system challenges. So I think a lot of our change strategies in the past and even in the current time have focused really on a deficit perspective of our field and the people who work in it. And I think that's so ironic because we ourselves are so interested in making sure that we're building on children's strengths. So the irony is that a lot of building our profession is really so deficit-based. 
So we have many strengths that we're bringing in this next generation, many ongoing challenges. I think that we need to get clear about what is our essential DNA, what the evidence is telling us to make sure that as we professionalize, we do not lose our passion, that we remember what the mission is, we remember what the assignment is, and that we focus a lot on our impact and the difference we're making in the lives of children and families. Well, well Laura, you know, um, you mentioned how when when we came into the, our generation came into the field, and yes, we did, there, were, there was a lot that was missing but my perception is there was a real unity around what quality early childhood education is and that there was a real respect for um, play-based uh, learning basically. And then we've seen this trend in education in general in the United States since No Child Left Behind and afterwards that um, has, pushed stressed academics and pushed academics down even at the expense of play to preschool and kindergarten. And that's one of the, the changes I've seen that, and one of the reasons we started defending the early years actually, is that, that we, we saw that push and the, and the sort of elimination of play. I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, absolutely. We need to follow the evidence, right? And I do agree with you. I think that the way that I put it, Nancy, is I think that when I started out in this field, we believed more than we knew. We were driven a lot by that passion, that mission. I think we're in a phase now that we know more than we're actually doing. So I think we the phases have changed. Follow the research. What is the research telling us about play base? It's not a matter of, you know, I want children to have a more play-based curriculum and you somebody else doesn't. It's what is the evidence showing us about what is most effective with young children? Oh, so, that's so good. Yeah, wonderful yeah. to hear you say that. Keep Continue, please. Well, I see in the chat, somebody's talking about practitioners. I have written a lot about this and I think the Kale Institute is very focused on bringing the voices of practitioners and making sure that a lot of what we're offering is bringing a lot of the knowledge base to practitioners in a conversational tone um, and providing people with follow-up resources if they want to dig deeper. So again, as people are writing in the chat, we have a long way to go to respect practitioners to respect the people who are actually doing the work. And again, it's, I think it's really foundational in this idea that we view our profession through a deficit lens. And as long as we're mo moving it through a deficit lens, there's this idea that you need an elite group of people to lead the field and tell everybody else what to do rather than understanding that a lot of wisdom from the field is gonna come from the ground, a kind of grounded theory that there is wisdom in what people who are doing the work actually know. I There's think that room is so for... powerful, thank you. Yes. That is like, I, I mean, it's just because, you know, <laughs> it made me think of that, you know, we all know what they say the oldest profession in the world is, but it's actually caring for children, if you think about it. <laughs> Caring for children is the oldest and greatest. For, we have done it. We have done it throughout our history as human beings. The care of young children is in our DNA, passed down from who we are as a people, because it is something that we had to do to advance. That, that we had to do to be here today. We had to care for the young children and we've always done it, but it's not discounted. It's discounted. It's not valid, justifiable knowledge of what we know, right? We know these things to be true. People all the time are like, well, who said that? Can you quote that? Can you cite that? I don't have to cite that. I know that <laughs> in my DNA that caring for children is valuable and how to do it, right? It's wisdom. It's so important. And so I just, I'm sorry, I just had to jump in because I think that we get yeah. caught up on the disagreement, but it's there within us and practitioners who do it every day, they know it, right? They know it and they do. And there's a lot that they can learn. And that's a lot that we can all learn, but it doesn't discount what we already bring to the table. What we already do every day is so important and so valuable. Yeah, let's respect that 
tacit wisdom and that tacit knowledge that that comes. You know, when we think about the whole adaptive leadership theory, one of the things that they say in adaptive leadership is when you're trying to make change, it's just as important to know what to keep as it is to know what to take away. And that's the DNA of the profession what we must keep, what we absolutely cannot do without. So I think a lot of times people focus, again, from the deficit perspective of what we want to stop. Let's stop getting rid of people working with children who don't have this kind of training or who don't have that kind of degree, but they're not really thinking from an asset perspective about how to build on strength. To me, change and progress has to be built on strength of what we want, not what we don't want. I've been, I've thought about this a lot because when I have my, my visions of how the whole field of early childhood is going to explode with resources, how do we implement a professionalism in a way that includes these incredibly gifted, knowledgeable people in the field? If you look at a country like Finland, you have to have a master's degree to teach. Well, that's not something we could implement here. We have a whole field of practitioners who are, who are um, working with young children in a range of ways in different kinds of settings and with different backgrounds, but with enormous amount of knowledge. So how do we somehow honor all of that at the same time as we sort of raise up the whole field and um, hopefully get more resources for you know, quality early childhood? Yeah, and I think that, again, we might even start thinking about competencies differently so that, you know, again, instead of simply thinking about attainment of a certain degree or a certain kind of credential, we can also think about competencies along a continuum and look more seriously, because one of the things that we have to understand, and I think, you know, degrees are important and we all have them. But I think it's really important to realize that a degree and competency are two different things, that a degree, we think, is kind of a substitute thinking about what the competency is, particularly in a field like ours, where it's different from other fields, that there is not a standard thing that if I go to University A and you go to University B, and we both have a degree called early childhood education, it's very unlikely that we studied the same thing in the I, same way. Yeah. So what was the competency? Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, I'm, I've taught in many different universities and seen different approaches to early child education. And again, it's, you know, and that's, that's sort of what we want in this country, the freedom to pick a different, we don't want everyone going to the university, same curriculum, everyone across the country getting that same knowledge, but we do want a basics of what is important, child development theories, so people can understand, build on that take what they do every day, take the research, learn from it, improve it, but know that there are multiple ways, right, to do a lot of this work. But what are we, what is the root of what we're doing, right? Centering children, focusing on their childhood, authentic engagement experiences, whole child, like we can get behind some basics, right? That should be, that should be what we're all focusing on that they can lead us to think about um, how we're doing that in diverse ways. And I love hearing from people who do that in diverse ways, right? I learned so much visiting different educators, child care providers, right, caring for children, whether it's in their home or a center or a classroom or internationally, where I would, I had the um, ability to go to a conference in Scotland and learning about play in different countries and how they're doing it in field of health, right, and occupational therapy, right, and it's such a, it's such a great space to be in, right, to take that diversity, but I think we fall into the trap where, if you know, we want everything done in the same way, and children aren't standard, right, they're not standardized, and we sh shouldn't be trying to standardize their education as much as we are trying to perfect professionalize the field, right? Because that professionalism mm -hmm. brings us stuff that we need, right? From uh, our lawmakers, our stakeholders, our philanthropists, the people who are going to invest in us as well, too. Well, I think one of the thinking challenges that we have is we think that being professionalized means being standard and being, and it doesn't. So I think that language, when we're using those words interchangeably, that's a challenge for our thinking. But one of the things I think we learned a lot during COVID and as we think about next level advocacy strategies is we've learned clearly that, you know, 
we have to find solutions in a rapid time frame. And that means that we have to be learning fast, that we have to understand the complexity that's going on of change. We have to understand that business as usual is impossible. It never worked for us anyway, and it's pretty impossible right now. And that the standard ways that we have used in communities and states to deliver these services are ineffective. It's ineffective to meet the community needs. So we need a next level generation of leaders that understand that complexity, that understand systems, that have an asset-based approach to the profession, and that really will honor our DNA and remember the mission and the purpose that we have in our hearts, because it is a combination of our hearts, our heads, and our hands doing the work. I love well, that. That is a really wonderful mm -hmm. set of summary ideas. I so appreciate that. There's so much there, and it's really inspiring, Valora, to talk to you Thank about this. You. Thank you so much. Yeah, and we, you know, I shared with people that you're you're not able to stick around for the whole Q&A, but we would follow up with some questions. There's a lot of technical, specific questions, as you know, funding inequities between public schools and early childhood, the, the drain of the staff, right? You can't keep a staff. And I, I have a perfect example. I tell my students all the time, I finished my bachelor's degree in 2003. I wanted to go teach at a child care center. Um, and I, you know, I said, okay, as long as I can leave here at 430 to go make the real money at my restaurant job. And he said, no, I need you here till six. And I was like, oh, I can't take this job at the <laughs> salary and work till six o'clock every day because I can't afford it. Right. And fortunately I, I had to go teach in the public school because I was off by 3.30 and off I went to still make more money in my restaurant job, right? And so, and that's, it's, it's even more cute today where we can't hold yeah. on to our um, our child care professionals because they're being lured into the public schools with, you know, more pay, better schedules and things like that. And so I, I'll send you those questions. Um, someone did ask in our last two minutes together, how can people get in touch with you and the Kayla? <laughs> so well, I figured I'll, I'll let you share that. Thank um, you. Ambition. Thank you so much. If you, if you want to send us an email, you can send it to info at kale.org um, or look on our website. We have all of our free webinar series that people can access for free. We've had webinars on the fiscal cliff if you want to dig more deeply and in, into that topic. And before I go, I do want to say to all of the hundreds of people who are on your series, I really want to just personally thank people for hanging in there and the work that you do. And one of the things that you can know is that you are making a difference every single day in the lives of children and families. You never have to ask yourself if you're making a difference. You might not be getting paid, but you are definitely making a difference. And I personally want to thank you for that. Thank here, you. Thank yes, you. here, here. Thank you so much, Valora. We really appreciate yeah, having you. Pleasure. Thank you for sharing that in the chat. Also, we're going to drop the link to that um, Cal, um, Kale Institute uh, webinar about the fiscal cliff because it is something mm -hmm. important. And we hope to follow up and partner with you to do a whole separate webinar just on the upcoming fiscal cliff and what we can do. So if we didn't get to answer your specific early childhood funding questions, join us um, at a later date and, and, and follow along. And we hope to have that conversation um, because it is super important. So thank you so much, Laura, for joining us and Nancy for you. As well. um, but we've got a lot to cover today. So we're going to transition um, to our next panel to highlight some of those early childhood, early um, education and care policy wins, right? So they do happen, believe it or not. Um, so each of these wins have been added to the DEY advocacy map. And so we're putting a link to the in the chat to the map. If you haven't seen it, we encourage you to check out the map, share it with your networks and submit resources, which include, right, we include legislation that's pending, right, that you're trying to put forward related to early childhood advocacy. So this is any legislation in child care or in K through three, right, because that, that also includes um, early childhood areas. Articles about grassroots advocacy work. So if your work is being featured in an article and you want to share the article, we encourage you to do that. Um, and links to organizations that are doing this grassroots advocacy work. So if you're one of those organizations and you're not on our map, you need to get on there. There's a button on the map where you can submit a resource. It comes to us and, and we'll get it up there. And we'll get it plugged in. But the three people we're about to hear from today are on the map. I made sure all of their um, amazing organizations and work um, was on there. 
So um, each of these wins, as I mentioned, have been on the map. And so we're going to start with our first policy win, which happened in New Mexico. Um, and so we're going to bring on Jessica Cowdery, and I'm going to read a little bit of her bio. Um, Jessica Cowdery has been advocating with parents, educators, youth, and community partners for over a decade with a shared vision where all New Mexicans can thrive. She started a program as she started as a program coordinator for Abriendo Puertas opening doors with the Partnership for Community Action before being hired as the policy director at CHI St. Joseph's Children, charged with working in a coalition to pass early childhood constitutional amendment. The ballot measure passed in 2022 with 70% approval and will, will result in the investment of hundreds of millions of dollars into the New Mexico early childhood for generations to come. I will post the rest of her bio, but we got to start right there. So I was just literally like reading about this, you know, headlines pop up and it said, you know, New Mexico passes constitutional amendment to guarantee early childhood funding. And I was like, wait, wait, what, what, back up. What is this? What's going on? Um, so I reached out to some friends I know in New Mexico and said, uh, what's going on here? And who can you put me in touch with? And so I got in touch with Jessa and some of her colleagues. Um, she took the time to meet with me and to explain the whole thing. And I was like, by the way, we want you as part of the Institute because this is an amazing policy win in New Mexico and it was coalition work and that's so important. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica to provide a brief overview of the recent policy win. And then she's gonna join us with our other two policy initiatives to talk more about this work. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Um, it is such an honor to share a little bit of our journey over the past decade plus um, in movement, movement building uh, with community to secure reliable, sustainable funding for early childhood, high quality early childhood programs, right? And it's so important that we we're talking about high quality, right? Including linguistically and culturally sustaining programs that are community-based. So as a state, um, we have consistently been at the bottom of many indicators when it comes to child well-being and education, especially for our children of color. And in New Mexico, we are a minority majority state or it's about seven out of 10 children are children of color. So we needed to address this head on. So a group of advocates came together. Again, this is like 15 years ago. And it, it, the coalition became a group of over 40 organizations. But at the time we were looking, how do we fundamentally change these outcomes? And all of the arrows are pointing to early childhood. Um, so, at the time, the state budget, it was like 1% of the state budget, very small amounts of funding was going into early childhood. So we had to find the money. And it was the midst of the Great Recession. We had a governor who did not support raising taxes. Um, we had to figure out where we could find the money. And lo and behold, New Mexico has a land grant permanent fund. It's like the fund that shall not be touched. It's kind of like some folks have called it the golden cow. Um, and it's now valued at $26 billion. Right. So just time out, time out. 26. Bi what's a billion? Right. A little social math. One billion seconds is 32 years. One billion pennies stacked on top of each other is 870 miles high. If one were to earn twenty two thousand dollars a year, I mean, forty five thousand dollars a year, it would take twenty two thousand years to amass a billion dollars. So it's a huge amount of money. The size of the fund in and of itself is inequitable. But that's another conversation. Right. So. That fund uh, is dedicated uh, to the, the majority is invested in Wall Street. 5% goes to K-12. Our proposal increased it by one more percent for early childhood. And it made sense, right? So our land grant permanent fund is governed by our constitution. So we had to push a joint resolution to put it on the ballot because the voters of New Mexico were the only ones who can change our constitution. So, you know, we were talking legislators. Why over a decade to pass it? The legislators were being gatekeepers. We just wanted them to let the voters decide. And, you know, there was comments like, oh, we can't trust the, the, the voters. Very paternalistic. They're like kids in a candy store. We're the adults. We know how to be fiscally responsible. I'm sorry, but leaving 30 uh, billions of dollars under the mattress, as we like to talk about it in Wall Street, is we need to put that money to work for our communities and our families. You know, over a decade doing, you know, presenting the research on early child, the Heckman equation, the return on investment, convincing the educators it's not childcare, it's education. And 
you know, but at the end of the day, it was the poor, the organizing, the poor wages that we had to increase wages for edu educators, early educators, the childcare deserts, especially in our tribal and rural communities, expensive childcare where we could find it or long waiting lists. At the end of the day, that's what kept us going. Um, and spoiler alert, it did pass, right? Um, but, you know, after a decade plus of analyzing, we're like, why isn't this passing? It makes so much sense. And it was about entrenched racism systemic racism. The majority of the children who are going to benefit are children of color. And the horrible, sickening irony is that this fund, the money comes from land that was stolen from our tribal communities and stolen later from Mexican land grants. So it's just the, you just start to unpack it all and you just see it over, you know, generations. And so we were failing. Our system was failing our Native American students and our Hispanic students and our Black students, our children of color. And it was so heartbreaking. We have 23 sovereign nations in New Mexico. How incredible is that? So we had to do a better job at providing that linguistically and culturally sustaining programming so that we could keep our 10 indigenous languages alive. We still have these amazing assets. So we had to take the system head on and it's, it comes to money, right? So drum roll, March of 2020, um, the end of the legislative session, we passed it out of the legislature and we had to get congressional approval. So we like, you know, we were working through the Congress to get that before the elections of 2020 um, passed. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, later uh, I got my timeline mixed up. But at the end of the day, the general election of November 22, the voters passed at 70.3% of the electorate. This was huge. Democrats, Republicans, independent were all out in support. And this is hundreds of millions of dollars invested in early childhood into perpetuity. There's no sunset. It's incredible. Um, so I can put a little bit more text on what that means in the, in, you know, more in the weeds, but high, high level, free child care for children under 400% of the federal poverty level, universal pre-K, universal home visiting. These are things we're building up to. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, but can you really just quickly share the, who the we is? Because I just want you to yes, yes, yes. that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think we's... that's super important. <laughs> Thank you. So the 40 plus organizations. Invest in Kids Now Coalition. We would march at the Capitol every year. We did those, you know, house meetings, organizing. And so it was, uh, you can find a long list of coalition members on investinkidsnow.org. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessa. And we're going to have you back shortly because we want to ask more about this amazing work. But I love your excitement because that's how excited I was when I heard this. And I'm like, wait, and then yes, that fund. I mean, it's it's unbelievable to think that much money can sit there in a state that has so much poverty. And thank you for acknowledging that it is a legacy of racism and stolen land and trying to deny children of color what is inherently theirs and belongs to them and their families. And so thank you for saying that because it needs to be said. People understand, why aren't we like other countries? Because of our entrenched racism. And we just have to acknowledge that. We, we have that other history, it's not going anywhere and it keeps us from doing a lot of things. But when you put it to the voters, 73% say we're not dealing with that anymore. We're going we're gonna to do this. And so super excited to hear from you. All right. So Jeff is going to come back and join us shortly. Uh, but next, we want to hear from our next policy win, um, which is Linnea Westerlin, who is a Seattle-based advocate for Parks, Play, and Recess and the parent of three tweens teens. She co-led the successful Washington State School Recess Campaign this year. She's also a guidebook author, co-founder of Outdoor Childhood Puget Sound, and the creator of yearofseattleparks.com. I'm going to include her LinkedIn where you can um, connect with her. And so tell us recently about the recess win in Washington State that you got to uh, spearhead and, and work for. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. I've already had so many interesting uh, things come up that I'm tying into, into my work. So I'm excited to share about what we've been doing in Washington around elementary school recess. Um, I uh, work as a nonprofit communications consultant, but do all this work as a volunteer because I just care a lot about um, issues related to education. As you mentioned, I'm a parent um, of three school-age kids. Um, and I volunteer in a bunch of different capacities, including on the advocacy committee of something that's called the King County Play Equity Coalition. And this is a coalition that's made up of over 100 um, organizations in King County. That's the largest county in the state that includes Seattle. Uh, we are a very diverse county. We have some of the most diverse zip codes um, in the country and um, some of the zip codes that have the most languages spoken in the country. Um, and the coalition is made up of everything from like the sp pro sports teams, King County, parks, University of Washington, 
to super small micro level community organizations that are working in, you know, with a very particular um, group of, of kids um, in different parts of King County. So um, it's a really um, awesome coalition because there's so much great work happening at all different levels. Um, just one more piece on the King County Play Equity Coalition that roots all of this is that um, in 2019, what launched the coalition was a report that was done um, originally with the University of Washington and now and part of what became King County Play Equity Coalition and examined um, how much play kids are getting in King County um, and found that in our region, only about 22% of boys and only 16% of girls are getting the recommended 60 minutes of daily physical activity. That's lower than national averages, although national averages are not great either. Um, so part of the mission of the King County Play Equity Coalition is really to address that. So to focus on changing the needle on play, on physical activity, um, and really focusing on youth of color, low income households, kids with disabilities, immigrants, and girls. Um, we explored a lot of different policy areas over the last two years um, to sort of decide how do we want to put our energy, what's going to make the biggest difference. And um, we really landed on elementary school recess as something that could have the biggest impact on the most number of kids because kids are at school. And for many kids, uh, recess might be the only opportunity that they have all day to be physically active for a variety of reasons. You know, there's a lot of kids that don't have access to sports for many different reasons. Um, they may not have safe parks to play in in their neighborhoods. They may have parents working multiple jobs who can't take them anywhere after school. So schools play a huge role in giving kids opportunities to play and be physically active. Um, and we also know that recess is associated with a lot of different benefits. And just to name a few, better concentration in the classroom, fewer behavior issues, lower stress and anxiety, increased student and teacher happiness. There is just really robust research that shows all of this. Um, so we found that um, we, we needed to really address this at the state level. Um, as from the county perspective, we have um, 39 cities in King County, and it just, there really isn't a mechanism to address elementary school recess, except for to go to every school board. And we felt like, you know what, this needs to happen at the state level. Um, uh, over the years, a couple of opportunity or a couple of chances to pass legislation at Washington state level around recess have come up and just been, have died in session. So we knew we were sort of in an uphill <laughs> climb, but we tried to be really strategic about it. Um, so we really just worked for 18 months to kind of build a statewide coalition. We needed to get outside of King County. We needed to talk. Um, we have a very rural um, and more conservative Eastern Washington. Um, it's very different than Western Washington. We wanted to talk to everybody and we found so much crossover on this issue. Uh, we had so many parents and organizations um, from all different sort of walks of the uh, political spectrum that were just like, yes, this is something that's great for kids. So it was really cool to work on something that so many people agreed on. Um, so our goal was to introduce a bill in the 2023 Washington State Legislative Session. In Washington, we only have a, a session that's about three months long. So we knew we had to really get in there, probably have a bill pre-filed. Um, and what we learned is that it was an extremely bumpy road and we learned a lot. Um, almost all of us were completely new to advocacy. We were not lobbyists. We knew so little about the process. We knew how to ask a lot of really dumb questions <laughs> and get answers, which helped us. So we kind of realized that we could be a little bit fearless and play the sort of, we don't know the <laughs> card. And that worked um, to, to a large extent. Uh, we ultimately were successful. So in April, the governor signed the first um, elementary school recess bill in Washington state. And it was, it passed very strongly bipartisan on the House side, I think 83 to 15 or something like that. Um, and it also sort of interesting on the Senate side, it was completely partisan. So we only had support from Democrats. That was not originally true. We originally had some Senate um, sponsors on the bill, but um, a lot of politics happened. And, but ultimately we were able to be successful. So the bill guarantees 30 minutes of elementary school recess and helps with, hel with um, helps end the practice of withholding recess. Um, among some other things. So we had to compromise on some of the aspects of the bill. We originally wanted 45 minutes. We wanted some tougher language. We didn't get everything we wanted, um, but we learned how to compromise and that was great. And, you know, just ultimately we're really excited about the difference that that's gonna make for thousands of kids in Washington. So um, I'm happy to, to kind of dig into some of the details later, but that's just kind of the overview.
Thank you so much. Yeah, and yeah, I know. I'm, I can't wait to share more of the story about how you go from 45 to 30 and how we got to take what we can get and then hit them again next year and the year <laughs> after until we get the bill that we want. But yeah, it was very exciting watching uh, watching those developments go forth. You know, we saw the same thing with Illinois a couple of years ago, getting their um, early childhood recess bill passed and then a right to uh, eliminating testing in the younger years bill. So it's a, it's a, it starts, right? A progression. It's like dominoes. You'll start knocking them down and maybe the coalition will say, what's next in our equity work and you'll tackle something else, right? That needs to be exactly. done. Because, yeah, once you get that taste for the first win, it'll it'll get you doing mm -hmm. more. And so we're super excited uh, to hear more about your work. All right, thank you so much. Um, so now we have one more policy win that we want to highlight before we bring everyone back together for a full conversation. Um, so we have Monica Weedle Lubinsky. I think I said that right. You got it. Good. You got awesome. it. Awesome. Great. Uh, so Monica has pursued her love of nature-based education for over two decades. She began her career at Irvine Nature Center in Owing Mills, Maryland, where she directed nature-based programs for children, families, and teachers, spanning her 19-year tenure. She received the Margaret O'Neill Award in 2017 in recognition of her outstanding accomplishments in nature-based education. Recognizing the need for nature-based teacher training and professional networks, Monica founded the Eastern Region Association of Forest and Nature Schools, uh, which has a nice acronym of E-R-A-F-A-N-S. Um, Air fans. Air <laughs> fans, okay. Um, in 2016, with support from colleagues across the region, this led to the creation of the Nature-Based Teacher Certification, a 36 clock hour course that more than 800 teachers have completed hailing from all 50 states and 24 different countries. Arafan's membership has swelled to a network of nearly 1,200 members. She has founded co-founded co three nature-based preschool programs in the greater Baltimore, Maryland area and consults to help countless others breathe life into new, into new nature-based programs in schools. I was fortunate to speak at one of the Arafan's conferences a couple of years back during the quarantine times and to share my work on diversity with people interested in nature because we know that these programs can be closed off maybe, be a little considered, oh, that's what white families and white kids do and how do we diversify who we're offering Offering it to how do we diversify how we're offering it so I was really excited to do that um, and then recently Keisha Reed our director of communications and outreach was sharing the work you were doing in Maryland around the outdoor preschool licensing I think I said that correctly and it touched off a lot of questions like why do you need outdoor preschool licensing how did this work come about um, so we wanted you to share that story so please give us a brief overview um, and then we'll welcome back Jessa and Linnea and we'll have a conversation about what does it look like to, to, to get these wins going well thank you so much Denisha and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, share this journey with all of you um, as Denisha mentioned my experiences are in nature-based early childhood education and for some of you, perhaps that's kind of a new uh, or, or novel idea, but the concept is to just embrace that nature is a teacher in and of itself and uh, doesn't need to be instead of other forms of learning. Um, instead, it just supports um, healthy growth and child development for the whole child. So with that in mind, um, a group of us had been watching what was going on over in Washington State, again, with Washington State being so progressive. Um, we were watching what was going on with the Washington State Outdoor Preschool Licensing Pilot. And um, I want to make a little distinction here because it's very important to, to note that Obviously, there's already the ability for programs to be licensed for child care centers to be licensed in home child care and so forth. However, there are a wonderful group of programs that take place only outside. They're completely immersed in nature. They do have shelter spaces for emergencies. Um, they do have procedures in place for, you know, safe toileting and hand washing and food and things like that. But they don't have buildings. And so because there's not a main classroom space, it presents issues with licensure. As you might imagine, uh, most licensing specialists just don't know what to do with that. And right away, it's a no. So Washington State um, really led the charge in this saying, hey, this is another form of learning. And it might not be the form that everybody wants. But so long as it's not licensed, we're closing off access. We, we have a systemic barrier in place for families who need to use scholarship funding and financial aid from the state. Those families cannot attend these immersive and highly beneficial programs as long as they are not able to be licensed. Um, so that 
is really the kind of overarching and really huge push to uh, find a way to license these programs. Now, that said, there are also some real challenges regarding uh, the vetting of teachers and safety practices and things like that. Obviously, part of the benefits of, of state licensing and one of the reasons it's in place is to protect children and make sure that ratios are safe and teachers have first aid and CPR and, you know, just basic things that are really important in um, knowing about working with young children. And a lot of these programs are in existence anyhow, licensed or unlicensed. They can't be licensed in, in most states. So they are pr primarily unlicensed programs and they're taking children in in settings that can be more challenging, certainly, um, and more dangerous, frankly. Um, so we need to be sure that we know where all of those programs are so that we can vet teachers and we can make sure that when they operate, they are following safety practices to be sure that kids are safe. So, you know, we have this, um, this real equity piece. We have a safety piece. We also have an issue around... Um, professional development, uh, because in the state of Maryland, which is where uh, I'm based, in Maryland, there's also a professional development fund, and that fund ensures that if you take training, the state will help you pay for it so that you can stay current and get all the relevant training that you need. Well, if you're running a program that's not licensed, you, of course, aren't able to access those dollars. And there's a whole lot of other um, pieces around the length of the day that you can operate because you're not legal, you can't legally operate a full day program um, without being licensed. So the kinds of families who can attend these short part day programs um, uh, that, that have high tuition because there's no subsidies coming in from the state in any way, um, it's people of privilege mostly, or people making very large sacrifices to, to find some kind of alternative way to get their children involved in these programs. So I hope I hope that hasn't gone on too long, but um, we, we started in 2020 uh, by forming an advisory team, an outdoor preschool licensing advisory team, um, reaching out to people from all over the state of Maryland, various stakeholders, everyone from parents to school directors to um, environmental environmental organizations, anyone who might be interested in supporting this work. And um, we have somewhere around 100 people who have actively participated as part of that advisory team. And we tried to pass this bill for a pilot program that would establish a pilot program to basically say, hey, state of Maryland, we know you don't know how to do this, this licensing piece for outdoor programs. Let's pilot some. Let's have a, a handful of programs who are willing to be pilots and let's figure out as we go. It's sort of like an action research <laughs> in, in real time to figure out where are the issues? Where are the lumps and bumps that we have got to figure out the right guidelines um, for, for these immersive programs? So the first year we we attempted it, we started in 2020. We, we tried to pass the bill last year in 2022, um, unfortunately installed in committee. It didn't go anywhere. And so we went back to the drawing board and we thought more about Okay, who whose face do we need to be in front of? Who's who do we need to sit and explain and tell in a really short way uh, the importance of this bill? And so we started doing the hard work, and we ramped up a, a campaign as well that was a lot of letters, um, a lot of just grassroots parents and community members saying this matters. This should be an option. It's no one's saying everyone has to do it, but it should absolutely be a fair option for families that that choose it. Um, so that's that's where we are. And flash forward to now, uh, we did pass the bill. Um, it did have bipartisan support and um, it started with 13 co-sponsors. And when it passed, I believe there were 27 or 28 so um, if you're curious to know more about that whole process, you can you can visit erafans.org. And if you go to backslash OPL dash Maryland, that stands for outdoor preschool licensing, erafans.org, OPL backslash, excuse me, dash Maryland, um, you'll get the whole rundown of what it is uh, we've been working on. So I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great place to stop. And thank you. And yes, we got the chat. We got the links in the chat um, to that so people Thanks. can learn more about that. And that's super important because the equity is such an issue, right? Like if it's not available under programs that can take in subsidy, then you're telling me that low-income parents can't have this option. They're being denied this option because they don't have 
the resources to pay for it out of pocket. That's so unfair, right? Like it's so important that all children get access to need if their parents want it. And, and again, it's not forcing everyone. Not everyone teachers want to be outside all day with children and that's fine. But there are some parents who are like, you know, I think it'll be good for my children to be outdoors a lot of the day. And I want them to have this experience and they should be able to have it and not have to make, like you said, those huge sacrifices to uh, be in a three hour program or, you know, you know, all the other things that they have to do. So we're really excited um, to hear more about this. All right. So we're going to bring back uh, Jessa and Linnea because um, now we're going to have a conversation with the three of us before we open it up. So uh, for those of you in the audience, um, we see the questions in the q and I, I heard that you might not be able to upvote. I'm not sure what the status is, but if you can see the other questions, there should be a little thumb that you can give up. And so that's how the upvoting works. If you can't see the other questions, put that in the chat and we'll not, we'll get our tech people, Jiro Studios on it. Um, but hopefully you can see them. And so we're going to try and um, streamline the, the Q&A and have like uh, the questions that people really want. Um, so yeah, I hear you, you can't still see them. So we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. But um, if not, we'll just pick the questions like as, as best we can. Um, but before we get into that, we just wanted to have a general conversation. And so my first question, and we'll start with anyone who wants to jump in is, can you share a brief example of some of the day-to-day -day work you did to push this policy initiative forward. You know, I know a lot of us have really good ideas and, and we don't know where to get started. We don't know what it looks like. How do I know I'm doing policy work? Is that policy related? What does that look like? And so I think it's different, right? But I think there are some things we have in common that we wouldn't even know till we, till we hear about it. So if you can just give us a little snapshot of what it looked like uh, in the trenches as you were working on this, that would be great. And it looks like you can now see the other questions in the Q&A. So go ahead if you haven't while they're chatting and, and upload those questions. I'll just jump in, you know, um, grassroots organizing and that, you know, of course, um, when I started with Abriendo Puertas Opening Doors, it was around this, around talking with immigrant families about early childhood. And I just got a call from one of the facilitators um, who has now started her own childcare business. And so Maribel, I'm so proud of her. And this is after 15 years. So that's stuff we're seeing, but relationship building, making connections, commissioning studies to tell the truth, because sometimes legislative staffers put out politically motivated analyses. Um, organizing, house meeting, accountability town halls, virtual town halls, earned media, um, making a scene. We did, some of our partners did circle time sit-ins, the partners who are organizing with early childhood educators, where they take the, the child care into the roundhouse and sit down in the middle of the Capitol with all the lobbyists and lawmakers, and they would have a, a, a classroom right there, the thousand kid march every year. Um, and also having tough conversations in some of our early childhood coalitions, they didn't want to support it because it wasn't politically flavorable. So we had to hold our other uh, early childhood community accountable that, that they had to get behind us and support um, this, this funding. So those are just some of the things that, that popped to mind. I love that. I love the story circle teaching. And yeah, we, we, we help, we, you know, we encourage people to use our mini grants for different ways. And one of them is to go to the ha uh, Capitol and host a play day, show them what early childhood looks like in action so they can see it um, and bring those little children so that they have to like be mean to their faces, which most people, most elected officials won't do. Uh, so it's a great, it's a great policy strategy. Uh, who else would like to share what some of your day-to-day -day practices look like? I can jump in. I, I, um, I love all, all of those ideas. That was great. Um, I, we just ours was so was a little concrete, so it was a little different in that we kind of had like this eighteen month period of really needing to like ramp up, and we knew exactly what where we wanted to be. Um, and so I did this one hundred percent as a volunteer, um, and I you know I just felt like you have to throw yourself into it, and I do think you have to if you're going to actually make change. It can't be something that you just dabble a little bit in and think you're going to pass a law. So. Um, and while we had folks that, you know, had different roles as part of their jobs, we didn't have anybody that was like full-time staff dedicated to this. So it was very much like a, who can jump in and help out. And because we had this broader coalition that was wrapped around all of our work that helped so much. Cause we had folks that we could like lean on saying, Hey, can you come testify? And one of the comments that we got from one of the lobbyists we ended up working with, uh, I want to mention a little bit later too, is, um, they said that they, they believe that one of the reasons we were successful is that every time we had a hearing, we brought a new group of people to come uh, testify. So it wasn't the same faces over and over. It was folks from all different aspects of from parents to teachers to people that are doing you know work in the community, very diverse. So that was really cool. Uh, but we did just a, some of the tactics. Um, we held, you know, we held really regular meetings weekly during the session because everything was moving so fast. 
Um, earlier in the process, we actually did research on what all the other state laws around recess said, and we kind of put together our own database, which actually other states have asked for um, like access to. So we're trying to figure out a way to make turn that into something that could be really shared publicly and kept updated. Um, we met with recess researchers from the Global Recess Alliance to just to really understand the physical, emotional, and mental benefits so that we were speaking exactly to the research. Um, we built a website, we created social media platforms, we created our own social graphics, all this stuff that, you know, somebody ends up having to do. Um, we held focus groups with teachers to understand their perspectives. We wanted to know where we might hit snags. Um, we did a survey to parents to ask how much recess their kids, would, they thought they their kids had. You know, that's an imperfect method, but we also asked how much recess do you think your kids have and do you ever hear about it being withheld? That, re that research ended up being really powerful in making our case later. Um, so we were really glad that we did that. And then we just met with tons of different groups, parents, PTAs, lawmakers. Um, and then we actually wrote the legislation, the draft legislation for the bill ourselves, which was really cool and empowering and, to, you know, and then testified remotely and in person because we had both options in Washington state. So just a handful of the things it was, it was busy and very fun and like fly by the seat of our pants. <laughs> I love it. And it is fun, right? I, I did some legislative work in law school and it's so exciting. And like people like don't realize it, but you're doing all these things and meeting with all these people and hearing these all the ideas. And it's like, that to me is democracy in action, folks. Like that is it. And it's like, yep. it, for a democracy nerd like myself, it just fills me with so much joy. Just even hearing about it, I'm like, oh, I bet it was cool. I bet those meetings were awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> but yeah, thank you for sharing that. Okay, Monica, tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day work. Well, everything that that, that um, Lene and Jessa have said just really resonates because it, it, you know, there are so many different things that one can do to just try to wrap their, you know, arms around whatever this this new policy needs to be. Um, I also had no experience ever with anything like this, and you know, for us, it was really important to start with understanding what the naysayers would say, you know, we we needed to know what the challenges were from the state's perspective, what, you know, right, right out the gate, if they had concerns, we want to know what they are, so that we can help address those, you know, from the beginning. So having a meeting um, with the state um, office of child care was really helpful and informative. And, um, it did take time to figure out who were really the people that needed to be at the table and um, meetings, frequent meetings, just as, you know, all of you mentioned, trying to talk some more about, you know, who, how do we get uh, all of these letters of support so that when we go to testify that there's um, a demonstration of why this really matters. Um, the letters of support and the testimony, I mean, as you said, Linnea, getting different people to come in and testify for the different hearings um, was also really effective because we knew that then they could hear from a parent and they could hear from, you know, somebody who's done research in this area or, you know, just different voices that help make the case. Um, and I will also just say that, you know, with all of the social media that people pretty regularly use, um, graphics and online presence, um, those are just really quick, great ways to share information, good information. Um, and so, you know, yes, creating a web page, but, but truthfully, we did a lot more online, just helping people see these programs and helping people have some talking points so that that was a trickle, a constant trickle of here's why this matters. Here's what this looks like. Here's what we need to do. Uh, so a little combination, I guess, of, of those things. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I want to go back quickly. Linnea mentioned the Global Recess Alliance. I just dropped a link in the chat. Full disclosure, I am a member of the Global Recess Alliance, and that's how I heard about what was happening in Washington from one of our other members, William Massey. And so great organization if you're looking for more um, research and support on recess, right? And I do my, my, my research on play, but play is a part of recess, so it all kind of works together. And so I shared that there. Um, um, before I move into our next question, I just want to go ahead and jump into a question from the audience because it's in my chat window now and then it'll be gone and I won't be able to see it. But it relates to what we're talking about right now. So the question is, 
Were there key stakeholders that you won over that helped turn the tide with legislative support slash public support, like the getting police support build to getting conservative politician support? Uh, what strategies can we replicate in our states? Um, especially, I guess this is kind of for you in New Mexico, Jessa, if we don't have a federal land reserve funds. But um, so thinking about funding, that's the question, what, what other avenues might be? But just in general, how did you, were there keys of people that you needed to convince them to come to your side um, to be successful? You know, uh, that's a great question, right? The gatekeepers, um, there were senators, you know, and uh, who who fell, uh, Senator John Arthur Smith, he had, he, he had to lose his, we don't get involved in elections, but we observe them. And so on this issue uh, and some others, this was a big one, he lost his seat and he was the most powerful senator in the state. And so, you know, when he was, they called him Dr. No, because he was the fiscal conservative Democrat. And in the end of the day, he lost his seat. So it was bringing the educate the public along um, for them to say, you know what, you are not serving, um, serving the needs of the state. So I think that that was a big one, just really bringing the edge, the public along with us, this, the whole decade, you know, the decade we were doing it. And, and that was what ended up, it was him and several other gatekeepers that in the end, we were able to overcome. I think that's so important, right? Because I think it sends a message to the politicians, right? We're working with you, we're doing our best, but at some point when it's up to the will of the voters, then we're gonna have to get rid of you. We're gonna have to go past and go around you, right? And to lose your seat, it to something like that is really powerful because it shows that you are here to serve the people. And this is something that people want. And if you're going to continue to be an obstacle, we're going to find a way, right? And I think that's the people power of our democracy that we lose sight of because it feels like the billionaires and the select few with the power control everything. But, right, we, you know, at the end of the day, we do have that. I'm sure he's looking to come back and regain his seat and you guys will have to keep a watch out for any type of retaliation. But uh, thank you for sharing that. Linnea or Monica, any uh, obstacles you guys were able to overcome? overcome um, in your work. I, I can uh, chime in on the sort of stakeholders. We did uh, realize that we had, you know, several major stakeholders in this. Um, and, you know, I'll just be, I'll be really honest here about what we <laughs> encountered. Um, we went to the Washington State PTA, who um, is, is supportive of recess and has a, um, had a, um, a, uh, a piece of legislation that they had passed at their um, PTA, like assembly, nat um, state assembly, supportive of recess, but they really weren't interested in coming to the table with us at the beginning, which we were surprised about. Um, but we, and, and, and then there was the principals association, which we met with and they were not supportive. Um, and then there was the school board association and they were not supportive at all. Um, and they don't support anything that um, changes any local control. Um, but we, so we knew all these players and we knew, we knew, to, you know, principals and, and school board would, would be tough. Um, they don't want, like to be told, you know, what they're going to have to do at the, at the local level. But then we, we knew that we had some, some support from the teachers association. And ultimately that ended up being the most amazing partnership that we wouldn't have, have made change without them. So, um, we had to like iron out a few little things at the beginning, but in general, they were just a huge partner. We didn't have any lobbyists. And if you don't have a lobbyist, I highly recommend finding an organization that has a lobbyist that can work with you. So their lobbyist was on the ground with us. I mean, at the same time as he was working on a ton of other education issues, um, but he really got us like inside knowledge. He knew all the stuff that we didn't know. Um, and I just don't think we would have passed it without them. Um, so I think the combination of having like the statewide teachers union and then this big coalition full of community partners was like kind of the key, the key piece. So that really made a difference. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, those coalitions are so powerful. And yeah, getting a lobbyist from another organization, that's a great one in kind donation, right? Hopefully yes. he came and would work for you, right? And that, that's really helpful. Yeah. Uh, um, I would just, uh, yeah, I would just add that um, it was really helpful, you know, in our case for our delegate to see one of these programs in action. I know that, you know, Delegate Guyton would have never sponsored the bill if she didn't see it and like feel and experience the value of the program in action. I think for something like an outdoor preschool, it's easy for people to be really dismissive of it 
because they think it's fluff and, you know, they don't really grasp the real learning that's taking place sometimes. Uh, so that was really pivotal. And I will say that her chief of staff as well, which you don't always think about their support staff, but her chief of staff really made it his business to understand this bill and the, the reasons for it. And I will say there were a lot of conversations had behind the scenes by that chief of staff uh, to, to build bridges to build partnerships. And ultimately for us, it couldn't have gone anywhere without the support of the Office of Child Care. And so there was a really large, um, there's, a, there's a large organization that advocates for policy on behalf of the state. And in the first year that we proposed the bill, being very naive to the whole thing, it wasn't something that was even on our radar. So when they you know, opposed the bill, it was, we were sort of blindsided. So in the second year, we knew that, you know, we have to do a lot more here to help them understand the bill, build relationships, answer questions. And so, um, you know, that, that organization was certainly key in our situation. That's great. Yeah. And so it sounds like just to recap, you know, you told stories about building coalitions, right? Getting entrenched people who are nose out, but it didn't seem like you know, yeah, it wasn't hundred percent. So there, there are some no's and you didn't have to win them over, but you had to build that people ground support, right? For the main stakeholders who had to say, and you had to address the people who said no the first time, figure out how to win them over the second time, right? So I think it's important, like we know the people who are gonna be opposed to what we're trying to do. I don't wanna start with them, right? How can we get around them, right? So where can we, cause you wanna work with the people who you do have some, some room to grow, like maybe they're unsure and they need to know more and then they'll be on your side, right? And so how do we build those coalitions with those people instead of just trying to chip away at someone who's opposed? And you know, I've spent a lot of time working on that, right? And I just don't know if that's the best way. And it sounds like for each of you that you, yeah, some people you had to get around and that got to the electoral politics of it and getting that person removed so they can stop being an obstacle. But other times it was building up those coalitions with those important people, right? And like the teachers unions and all that. So that's so thank you for sharing. So my next question to the group is, um, what are some of the big picture takeaways you can share about making policy work? I could jump in. Um, just a few things that came to my mind. Um, you know, one is just to build the broadest and most inclusive coalition that you can um, as early in the process as you can so that you have those partners to go to. Um, and, you know, we asked for organizations to sign on as a partner and, and if we could use their logo and um, you know, organizations like Defending the Early Years, uh, both locally and nationally said, yes, we believe in this and we'll sign on. That gave us a lot of um, sort of um, credibility in this, which made a huge difference. We pointed to all of our partners. Um, I also think just finding the right sponsor for your bill is really important. Um, and that can be really tricky because you don't know what door is going to open when. We were, we had kind of talked to a few different legislators and had many positive conversations, but um, several times they just said, oh, we're, I'm working on a couple of other things and I just can't take this on as a sponsor. I'll definitely support it. Um, we ultimately found um, Senator Trina Nobles, a Democrat, who's one of the few women, uh, Black women in our legislature. She's a mother, she's an education champion, and she was an amazing partner. Um, she like asked for our input at every stage, especially when changes need to be made really communicative. Um, that was huge. And she has a lot of respect. Um, and I think her colleagues really listened to her. Um, and then we also had Representative Sam Lowe, a Republican, who was a former teacher himself. He just jumped right on board. And I think that's how we got so much Republican support on the House side. Um, so that helped a lot. Um, and then just a couple, two more things. Like one is just, we had to keep pointing to the research. Um, and I, I know both Monica and Jessa have, have talked about this. Recess is constantly just dismissed as being frivolous. It's amazing how many educators and people working in education, administrators, parents don't understand how essential uh, recess is. So we had to keep hitting that over and over. Recess is essential and why? And that's where all the you know Global Recess Alliance and the partners that we had that were researchers um, and, and PhDs on the subject really helped. We also had to really talk about it as a mental health issue. Mental health is something that's getting a lot of attention. That also cracked open a lot of doors for us. Um, we talked about how recess is a strategy. That's it's a common sense, easy, you know, low cost strategy to address mental health. I think that helped us a lot. And then my the last point I'll make is just like be prepared for a painful, frustrating process. So while I said earlier, like this was fun, it was not fun all the time. I, there were so many times when we thought we were, it was over, we thought it had died, we thought we were gonna end up with a bill that we wouldn't be proud to put our name on. 
Um, and so you kind of need to be prepared for that. And that helps you get through when you anticipate you're going to have the bumps. And you also need to surround yourself with some people that are going to be cheerleaders. So there's all different types of roles. Just having a few positive people that can kind of keep saying like, let's keep going forward. Let's keep moving. We're going to get through this. That really makes a difference. So kind of like building up that team of, of knowing what everyone's strengths are and just being prepared for um, a frustrating process because politics always is. Oh, because the struggle, right? It's real, but it's beautiful, but it's hard, but it's all of those things, right? So thank yes. you. I think that's so key. We talk about that a lot in justice work, right? The struggle is beautiful, but it's also hard. And you do need cheerleaders, people to come in, support you, help you heal as you're hearing your thousandth no and you're, you know, you're feeling like it's not going to work. And then you get to the point where you win, right? None of this happened the first time around, right? I think everyone suffered. Policy very rarely goes into effect the first time around, right? You have to take that loss and come back swinging the next day, our next session. So thank you so much. Uh, who else would like to share some of your uh, big picture takeaways? Um, I'll, I'll go and um, just say that it really was an exciting, process. It's, it's definitely a powerful feeling to know that you really can affect change. And um, Linnea's right. It's certainly, it's hard. It's, it's hard work. Um, there's highs and lows, you know, you get one little step forward and it's so exciting and then you're deflated and you're worried that it's, it's done. Uh, but it's, it's so worthwhile. So, I mean, my big picture takeaway is if there's, if there's an issue, if there if there's a challenge that you're facing in your community, as cheesy as it sounds, you absolutely really can change it. I mean, you can. I, I had no experience doing this before. I was just determined to say this. Look, I'm not the only one. Other people see this as an issue. It needs to be changed. And, you know, so reach out to your local uh, delegate and tell them about your idea. If it's if it's something that you're passionate about that really needs to change, you, you should not be intimidated by the process. It will be hard, uh, but you shouldn't be intimidated by the process. So that's that's my big picture takeaway. <laughs> I'll uh, just add, I can very much resonate with what's been shared so far. And, and just to add to it, I think like as I'm growing and in my professional career, I just, I'm realizing how incredible relationships are. You think, oh, I worked with this person a decade and I've been the and oh, they're calling me for a letter of recommendation, you know, and it's, and so the point is that what we build on the other end is incredible. Like we have a network of all these organizations. We're on the next thing. We're working on wage and career ladder. We're working on, you know, other early to making sure. And so it's, it's that relationships that are built. It doesn't go away when you're done. You just do the next thing. So that's incredible. Or, you know, you build a trust or you learn who you can't trust. And, and that too was, was something that we learned. And then the other thing is, so one of our main papers in the state was interviewing my, my other advocate, my, my sidekick, Alan, um, he's my boss, but he, uh, they're like, why did you go back year after year? And he started, it dawned on him. He said, every year they gave us something. They didn't give us the land grant permanent fund right away, but we got a new early childhood education and care department a whole standalone department, one of the first um, in the country. We have another child early childhood trust fund from the, you know, we export, we pump a lot of oil and gas. And so they made from the exceeds another fund. And so we kept getting a little bit more every year and then finally won. So just keep at it, whether it's politically flavorable or not, whether you have people come with you or fall to the wayside, you just, we, just keeping at it with the cheerleaders and and the conviction that, that we're making progress, even if we're not getting the big win. I think that's so important. When you told me that story, it's like, yeah, they kept trying to like shut you up with a little bit. Like, okay, we taking it. We gonna take it, but we're not gonna stop. That's so great. You got something, right? And now that early childhood department is, is in charge, is well helping you spend all this money and do all this amazing, great things, right? So it builds it up, right? And so, yeah, take the little bit that they're giving you, but don't stop. Don't stop getting the whole thing um, because that's super important, right? And they and they know that they're not going to be able to pawn you off with this little thing next time. Oh, they're back again in the session trying to do this again. Ah, oh, that didn't work, right? And so that's, that's super powerful. So I have one more general question before you, before we go to the Q&A. So please, again, if you have questions, um, please submit them in the Q&A function. Some of our DEY board members and staff are in there and sending me the questions and we'll start after this next one. Um, so my final question to the group is, um, what's next in your early childhood advocacy work? This is so exciting. You had these wins and 
please get some rest, take a vacation, do other things, but we hope that you'll continue to do policy work. So um, let's start with you, Monica. What's next? You've got this. So I'm, here's the thing. I'm really interested in this because I, you know, I, as I mentioned, I went to law school. I, I, I did policy work, right? And and getting the bill passed is the start. So I spent uh -huh. a, uh, I spent a semester working on a bill to remove the tax off of feminine feminine hygiene products. Um, it took successive awesome. semesters. Yeah, it took some successive wow. semesters of our students in the class working. Like we didn't start it, we didn't finish it. But to see that it took so long to get it approved, but then the actual implementation then took years more because it wasn't so much like we're just going to stop taxing this. It's like we're going to replace the billion dollars we received in tax money with what right. like that became the huge thing that the district of columbia had to now figure out it wasn't that simple right so yep. thinking about this policy you got this policy but as we all know child care policy yeah. can be the bane yeah. of our existence right so how you know what comes next and how do you make sure that the policy for licensing outdoor preschools does not make you not want to license an outdoor preschool. Because <laughs> we know that- uh, Well, you know what? And, it, and there's, yeah. it's a double-edged sword because the people that practice nature-based education, uh, there's a pretty large spectrum of, of the kinds of programs that, that run nature-based education programs. Um, and so I am really concerned about that. Uh, we did write into the bill that they have to work with the Maryland Outdoor Preschool Licensing Advisory Team, but it doesn't specify to what extent or how often. Uh, it does say they have to, and I and I guess I have a concern that someone would just want to check a box and move on. And and the point is, we we really do want to work with the Office of Child Care to make guidelines that make sense. And so. The pilot program will run for four years, and that's how we'll be discovering um, and not reinventing the wheel, because as I mentioned, Washington State is the only state in the country that has a licensing path for outdoor preschools, and they did a four-year pilot. So a lot of this is modeled off of that. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. I am concerned about what the outcome will be, and I don't want to be blamed if it kills the magic somehow of what it is we do. But I just keep reminding myself, at the end of the day, if it's not available to all children, it, it's it's not fair. And I can't I can't run an organization for forest and nature schools knowing that this barrier exists. I just can't. So for me, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional, but for me, it's just um it's just the way it has to be. We have to keep trying. So we'll do our best to be at the table. If if six months comes and goes and we feel like we're we're not at the table the way we envisioned it, we'll be back to amend that bill and put some language about how often and how frequently you're gonna need to work with us because we know there will be compromises. That's to be expected. We can't expect that it's just all gonna be perfect and rosy and smooth, but um, but but you know. Boy, we've just, we've got to try uh, and get the best the best outcome that we can, and that's where I'll be for the next four years, anyway. I love that, right? Because it's it, there are going to be compromises, and we're going to talk more about that in our first question. But um, I just wanted to share this. that that is how the legislative process is supposed to work. So, so when I was in law school, one of the things we were doing in my uh, legislative clinic, we were looking at, um, as we all know, the passage of the um, uh, sorry, the ADA Americans with Disability Act, right? So ADA passage was huge, lots of lawyers behind it, lots of disabled people fighting for it, right? But what they started to see over the years, right, were how judges were ruling. And they were interpreting the law off than what the advocates wanted. And when that happens, you don't go argue with the judge, you go back to the law and you change it. And that's what they did about 11 years later after the ADA. They said, we are not happy with how the laws are narrowing people's ability to access this law. And so they amended it and that's the work, right? So yeah, you're, you're gonna get this policy and you're, some of your providers are gonna be like, uh, that's not nature-based, what do you mean? What do you mean we can't have a fire? We know that there needs to be safety, but if you can't have young children learn about an outdoor fire pit, it, it, you know, it needs to happen, then you go back and you work it again and you get an amendment that says, you know, you you got to listen to us on this or you got to, we have to be a part of these decisions, right? Because if that's the process, right? And that's what a judge is going to tell you. Don't come to me, go back to the lawmakers, right? If, if we're not interpreting it correctly, that's the process. And so it's important that people know that you don't always get what you want the first time, but you get it, you look at it, you see what's not working and you come back. So keep us posted. We want to know how this is going in Maryland and what we can do uh, to support you along the way as well, too. Um, so now New Mexico, this is super important, right? Jeff, you got all this money and it's great. My 
impetus in reaching out was twofold. I wanted to know the story and you shared it, but I'm also concerned about what does this mean for curriculums, right? Is there going to be a mandated early childhood curriculum, something like, you know, success for all teaching strategies gold or something like that. When we know that from the research out of Tennessee, if you're not familiar with Dale Farron's research, we'll drop some links in the chat, but the state funded preschool, you know, the academic preschools aren't having the best results down the road. They do really good at the end of preschool and, and, but by kindergarten, those gains are gone. And by third and sixth grade, those gains are reversed to negative um, outcomes, right? And so I was concerned and I know it's not there yet, right? But so thinking about the future, what does the future look like in New Mexico around this fund? And, and yeah, what, just tell us about that and anything that we can do to support that. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> high quality was always something we were wanting to talk about and then saying, what is high quality? For example, um, one of the bills uh, that we just supported is uh, that passed is helping tribes maintain their sovereignty and self-determination with their curriculum. So we made it law that the tribes now can contract, get money from the state, but they have their own curriculum, their own standards based on their traditional indigenous knowledge systems. So it would be totally incorrect of us to try to fix all this and then whitewash assimilation and genocidal curriculums, right? That have really been damaging to the tribes in our state as well as other communities of color. So that is one example. Another one big is that they don't supplant the money, right? So we bring in land grant permanent fund and then they they cut the general, uh, the regular, the, the, the what comes in from the general fund. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't just putting in here and then taking down, we wanted it to raise to, you know, a, a upwards of 500 million per year that the department has to spend. And for such a small population, New Mexico is a small population. So that much money goes a really long way. And then I talked about the relationships that our coalition built. So now we are in a position where we're working with the department, legislative finance, and um, the, the governor's office. These are all the different power structures to start in the interim planning for next session instead of like, oh, you get to the committee hearing, what's this, this crazy report that has the numbers all mixed up. And so we're working together for like the wage and career ladder so that we can take experience, like we were talking about earlier, experience when we're talking about how much folks get paid, not just degrees, because we don't want to gentrify the workforce. Is women of color who've been doing this for decades. And so if we raise the wages and then all of a sudden, you know, if we gentrify the workforce, we have lost uh, what we have been trying to build. And so paid family medical leave act is another one that we're trying to get past so that not just early educators, but edu people have the opportunity to be off and professionalizing our legislature is a really big systemic one. We have a volunteer legislature and it makes all kinds of problems, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so that's great. And yes, those coalitions working through the challenges, where else can you spread all of this movement energy to direct it, right? And yes, the, the field, the pay, the paid family leave, all of that is so important to think about the breadth of early childhood. Yes, what happens in the classroom matters, but parents' ex access to time off from work matters too, right? Teachers' abilities to get training. Uh, yeah, that that idea that your, your time in the field is so valuable and thinking about the discrepancies between our early childhood women of color who've been doing this work might not have the degrees and might not be getting um, the same type of pay increases I think are super important and also keeping it open so that yeah the tribal leaders can do we, we saw the Supreme Court recently rule I mean it's slightly different but the Indian Child Welfare Act right and the adoption laws and how important that sovereignty is to the tribal groups in keeping that in different areas right in their early childhood education care and thinking about other groups like I love that we have I mean I hate that we have the Indian Childhood Welfare Act because we have it for horrible reasons but I'm glad that we have something like that and think about what would that would do for other groups right if we centered their needs as a cultural group and made sure laws didn't violate that and so I think that's a really good model uh, moving forward in New Mexico and other places to really think about the work that we're doing. So now we come to Washington. Um, you've gotten this recess and, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the things you didn't get in that. And I think that comes up in the next question, but what's next? What do you think, um, what does it look like in, in your, um, uh, from your perspective and what might come next for the work that you're doing with that play, the King County Play Equity um, Association as well? Yeah, so a few things, um, you know, related to recess specifically in Washington State, our next phase will be, it will take about a year for our, um, for the law to go into effect. So it won't go into effect until like the following school year, so a whole year and plus a few months. Um, so we'll just be doing a lot of work with PTAs across the state and local school boards. Um, the way our law was written, the work has to sort of be changed at the, at the school board level with language that we put into the bill. So 
um, we want to make sure that school boards understand what's in the law and that we have parents championing it, showing up at meetings, discussing it, um, and that this is like the low bar, so we, we can do more. <laughs> And in some cases, we hope that we will get, you know, more. There are some, there's support in some, in some school districts to do beyond what, you know, what we got here. And there are schools that are getting a significantly more recess. Um, so that's sort of what we're working on with um, recess um, it, at the state level. I'm also doing some, you know, national kind of like working with parents across the country. Um, there's other states that are in different stages of this work. Um, we're talking to some other parents about creating sort of a national database where parents could kind of tap into what's already been done and kind of like have some of these um, advocacy resources. Um, we also have a Facebook group called US for Recess. So those of you that are on Facebook, I know it's not always everybody's favorite place, um, but that's a place where we're sharing ideas and wins. So it's kind of a good place to network if you're interested in recess advocacy. Um, and then just other issues related to play. So King County Play Equity Coalition, we're looking at a, a lot of other issues where like there's so much work to do. So um, we're looking at middle and high school sports and particularly making sure that there's no fees for those sports, um, kind of quality of coaching, state standards for coaching, uh, possibly um, uh, trying to get some sort of statewide youth sports governing body, um, funding for green schoolyards, because I'd like to talk about that you know, kids need both quality and quantity of recess time. So they need to have the minutes of recess, but they also need a high quality um, playground to play on. So Green School Yards is a really big piece of that. Um, shared use agreements. Um, there's a lot to talk about that area. So we've got lots of ideas. We're kind of going to uh, figure out what, what is the next thing to really maybe narrowly focus on. We might try to do something at the state level and something more at the county level. Um, so those are a few things that, that um, we're kind of stewing on and, and is invigorating us. Awesome, great. Well, we look forward to hearing more of it and um, definitely wanna keep in touch with all of you. Um, so we do have some questions from the audience. And I think the first one, actually, I'll start with you, Linnea, cause I know we talked about this, right? So the question is, I'm interested in the compromises that come with this type of policy work. How do you decide which are the non-negotiable aspects of your legislative approach and what is worth to let go? Um, so I know we talked about both the roadblocks, right? People understand recess um, is important, but one of the biggest roadblocks is teachers and, and their right to use recess as punishment. And so that's one aspect, right? How do you negotiate that? Because we know if we don't have the teachers on board, it's, it's going to be an issue as well, too. And so Monica and Jessa, I'm sure you have other things as well, too. But I'd love to start with Linnea, just because I know this came up um, in her work as well. Yeah, so we... Um... We, as a coalition and as sort of as an advocacy committee, came up with the policy points that we wanted to see on a bill. And we pulled that from like what the research said, what other states had done successfully, and kind of, and, and, and then we had a lot of discussions around, you know, really we think that kids should get an hour of recess, but we know that's probably not going to happen. They tried to do that in Illinois and it got um, reduced to 30 minutes. Um, and then we said, well, if we start at 30 minutes, that's too low. And what if that gets moved down to 20 minutes? So we landed on 45. We knew that was aggressive. There aren't very many laws um, across the country that are giving that uh, number of minutes. But we decided to start with that. I think it ultimately ended up being a good decision because um, it was it was a, a palatable idea at the beginning in general. We hit some uh, roadblocks once a few particular senators really were, you know, they really have the ear of their local administrators and principals and they got a lot of pushback. And so then when we reduced it to 30, it seemed to kind of be like, oh yeah, well that makes sense. And then it just started flying through uh, to, for the most part. So I think um, maybe starting out a little higher helped us. I really wish we'd gotten those 45 minutes because 30 is still not very many out of a six hour, six, seven hour school day. Um, we also really wanted to actually ban withholding recess and we wanted to ban, so we wanted to ban withholding recess for academics or, or uh, punishment with very narrow exceptions, like if a child is a threat to themselves or others. Um, and we wanted to ban um, uh, using physical activity as punishment, like running laps or doing push-ups during the school day. It's a whole nother can of worms once you open that up to after school coaching, which we also advocate, you know, <laughs> around that as well, but this keeping these, these separate for now. Um, with the with the teachers union, we ultimately had to soften our language a little bit on the the ban on withholding. We they we got we ended up changing it to that we um uh that we want to discourage that. So it's not a full out ban. We did get the ban on um physical activity as punishment. So it's just an interesting you know thing. Really what I think it comes down to is like we're trying to make the practice taboo. 
And so however we can do that, that's probably what's going to re result in change. So we hope to really push that with messaging of like why you shouldn't withhold recess. And there's really robust research showing that you should not do that. It just backfires immediately. And the kids that are, you know, the, the big point that we made, and then I'll wrap up is that, you know, the kids that need recess the most and the kids that are getting the most, you know, inequitable uh, behavior management strategies, those are the kids that need recess the most. And it really affects, especially boys of color. Um, and so that, that really kind of drilled home for a lot of people, like why that issue matters. So those, those were just a couple of the compromises and it was tough to swallow. And we did have to have some quick discussions with our committee, like, and we voted at sometimes when we, you know, like, how do people feel? And there were a couple of things that we said, we will not compromise on this, but we're willing to compromise over here. Yeah, um, I think that's super important. And I just, you know, I know people in the audience were talking about it, but I just want to share quickly about this recess as punishment thing. First, I want to acknowledge to all the teachers, if you've done this, I, it's intuitive, right? I, I was directing a preschool in California and it was like my first week and these two boys were not listening. And I said, okay, boys, then you're you're going to lose your recess time. And the teacher looked at me and said, we don't do that here. And I said, excuse me, first of all, I'm the director, but that's okay. But I was like, what, what do you mean? She's like, we don't, we don't withhold recess as punishment and we don't punish them tomorrow for something that happened today. Tomorrow's a new day. Cause I was, I was threatening to withhold tomorrow's recess. And I said, well, then how do you get them to do what, what I'm telling them to do? And that's the crutch of it, right? I was trying to force them to do something in the moment. And so I turned to the only tool I had in my toolbox was withholding the thing you love tomorrow. And, and when you don't have that as your tool, guess what? You come up with a new tool. <laughs> She's like, you'll figure it out. And actually, I just had to give them a little bit more time. And they did do what I wanted them to do, right? And so it forced me to think about my approach to children. And, and, and it was lucky it happened early in my career. I was fresh out of grad school, directing a, a preschool program at a college. And I was just quickly taught, we don't do that. And I carry that with me everywhere I go. We don't, we don't do that here. We don't, we don't use punishment as recess as punishment. So I share that because a lot of us do it. We've taught, been taught to do it. It's the standard, but it doesn't have to be that way. And if you understand how valuable and important recess is, then you realize it should not be in your toolbox of how you help to change children's behavior. There's a lot of things we can do, but that shouldn't be one of them, right? And, and to value recess time as something that all children deserve and shouldn't be taken away for any reason. Reasons, um, is super important. And it just changed your work with children. So um, I'm just going to put that out there because I know some teachers are like, but I need to withhold recess as punishment. It's the only way to get them to do what I want. And I hear you, but I, you know, work with us. Join, reach out. We'll talk with you about how that might look different. Uh, Monica or Jessa, anything you want to share about compromises that you had to make um, in, in your journey? I'll, I'll go ahead. I think the, the one that was really hot topic was the percentage, right? We came out with 1%, just 1% for the kiddos and over this. So sometimes it was, I'll just get to the nuts and bolts. It was one year, we almost got 50%, a half a percent. We almost got a half a percent, right? So I was like, Alan, we can't settle for half a percent. And he said, half a percent today is better than nothing. And the, as the fund grows, that half a percent will also grow. We didn't end up passing it that year. And we ended up with a percentage and a quarter that's shared with K-12, they got a little bump too. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we have to take home what we can for our kids. And that that lesson stuck with me. Like maybe it's not what we had wanted and been fighting for, but it's something. Um, so that's what I wanted to share. Yeah, tough call, but you got it and you had to keep doing it. And yeah, we have to make those tough decisions sometimes. It's super important. How about you, Monica? Um, I would say that the one thing for us that was just not negotiable was for the state to run a pilot program around a topic they know nothing about. Um, they they don't already license immersive programs, therefore they have no point of reference. So there was no way we would be comfortable with them just plowing ahead to do a, a pilot program and establishing guidelines for something they they're behind a desk learning about. So to us, we felt like our advisory team needed to be part of the process. And as I say, we don't know how, to what extent, and we're really hopeful that it that we'll be as involved as we can be, but that was not, not a, a negotiable point. Um, there was some other back and forth about some of the specifics. And I think that it, we had to say, we're gonna address you know, we're going to address all of these health and safety things. It's one of the reasons why we want these programs to be licensed. So we have to be willing to name them. And that might make some outdoor preschool practitioners squirm a little, perhaps. Um, but that's part of why we're 
we're doing it. So we have to be willing to look at those things and really find solutions that work. So yes, there were there were some um, there was some give and take, and um, ultimately, you know, as I say, there's going to be four years to figure out how it all plays out. So. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so our next question, and it might be our last question. Um, does the expert panel have recommendations on resources out there that helped embed DEI, de diversity, equity, and inclusion work into your policy advocacy organizing work? And I know you've all touched on that, wh why it was important to, to diversify the approach and what you were doing and how that played out. But yeah, any recommendations or resources that you think um, well, others would like to, would benefit from? I'll just jump in. Um, I can't think of a resource, but always keeping those most impacted at the heart of the conversation. So member or like part folks in our coalition who did organizing with early educators, with parents, with community at the decision making table, I think was super important in ensuring that we're really thinking through all of these aspects. And I can, I, again, I, I don't know that I have a resource off the top of my head that I can point to, but um, sort of following up on what Jessica just said, we uh, used a policy screen that we kind of came up with ourselves. So as we were looking at different issues that we wanted to um, potentially pursue, we kind of created our own screening process and equity was a, a major area of that and how we define that and how it, what mattered about that came from sort of the origins of our coalition, which is a very diverse group of people um, and organizations. So we kind of used that and then had a filtering process of like, we before we pursued any strategy, we put it sort of through this filter. Like, is it meeting these um, important things that are the basis of why our, our coalition exists? Um, so that was a helpful approach for us as like, how should we spend our time and energy? And is this going to affect the most kids? And are we really addressing equity and, and closing the play gap? Um, and so that, that, that was helpful for us. I think for us, um, also a combination of just considering who makes up that larger stakeholder group who's advocating and making sure that the, the more folks are aware of the issues and who they affect, the more they're willing to say, you know, this is a barrier that needs to be removed. So that kind of building up of the advisory team and um, all those community members and just reaching out for that support um, from diverse groups matters uh, mattered and matters a lot. Um, I would also just say that because the pilot program will take place all over the state and one of the issues at heart is who gets to access it, then it's really important for us to be advocating for outdoor preschool programs that do operate in areas that are low resourced because they're the they're some of the people that we really hope to impact in a good way. So um, by making suggestions and you know for us really trying to have a survey of, of all these different programs across the state and where are they located, um, it was also a misnomer that we had to debunk a little bit that outdoor preschool programs only happen in very rural, affluent, wild spaces when in fact Baltimore City, they've got the third largest contiguous urban wilderness space um, east of the Mississippi. I mean, they have, you know, lots of parks and places where kids could access the programs um, and and not just in Baltimore City, but many of our many of our cities. Um, so also helping people to understand that this really is possible in in the communities that, you know, currently really aren't served. So um, those are just a few of the ways for us. I love it. It sounds really, really good stuff, uh, Linnea, that that policy kind of equity approach, right? Like, you know, it's because you're going to get pulled in so many directions and you want to stay true to what you're doing. So you need a template, something to help you like these are our goals. This is what we're looking for. This is what we're trying to align with. How do we stay on track? Right. So you, that you don't um, spread yourself too thin and go into other directions. Right. And look at other things. Um, and just to your point, yes, you have to be thinking about those people that you're trying to serve, right? They have to be at every part of it, right? Like sometimes people reach out to them in the beginning to do the needs survey, right? But they're not at the table when you're deciding how much to ask for and where it goes and all of that. And so they feel very used by a lot of people coming in, trying to make it seem like you're being more diverse than others, but how well are these people integral throughout the entire process, right? From start to finish. Um, and then also uh, to Monica's point, yeah, just thinking about um, the different places and locations and what's already being done. I think we just, 
discount that there are probably people of color doing nature-based things, but they're not on the radar and why not, right? And they're taking parts of that. And so how do you make them a part of this conversation? So this isn't something that's being done to them, but something that they can be a part of because if the, if the licensing comes through and becomes a burden to them, then they're going to say, oh, thanks for you taking what we were already doing and making it worse, right? Like we had to consider that when um, I work for an organization called Na uh, Black Lives Matter at School. And one of our demands was a um, to, to mandate a ethnic studies, right? And black history. We added black history because Philadelphia is the only school district that right now requires a black history course. And had we just say mandate ethnic studies, they could have came back in Philadelphia and said, well, we don't need to do this black history course because we're doing ethnic studies. And we didn't want to lose what we already had, right? But we worked where people with Philadelphia launched the movement. So they were a part of that. And they were able to help us with that language so that we didn't threaten something they already had done, right? And so it's super important that we think about those, those people to make sure that we're not going to come out with something that's going to harm them in any type of way. And if they're there at the table, then they're part of that decision and you'll know, right? And so I just wanted to share that and just thank you all so much. I hope everyone else really enjoyed this conversation. I loved it, hearing about it. Um, it's just great. I think we don't celebrate enough, but these are three concrete wins. They did not happen overnight. They did not happen from an individual. They faced uh, obstacles and challenges, but they kept going. They formed their coalitions. Um, they zeroed in on what they want. They built a grassroots effort and they saw um, the fruits of their labor pay off in these wins. And the work continues, right? It might you might come back with another challenge, whether it's the regulations and the guidelines and implementation. I think in Linnea's um, uh, story, you have a really opportunity to work with those teachers so that recess as punishment is really discouraged because they're going to get the support and the research and the parents behind them working together, right? I think that's super important that you form that time. Uh, take that time in the year that you have before the laws in effect and build that support so that teachers feel um, that they're not being ostracized for their choices in the classroom, but they're being supported by parents and the researchers and everyone saying, yeah, this is going to benefit you too. Um, you mentioned something earlier and I study this, the benefits of play for teachers, I think it's highly undervalued. And all of the teachers I know who are into play, it's, it's because it's reciprocal, right? The children are benefiting and they're benefiting. And so I hope that in this next year that you can continue to kind of put that out there so that when the law comes into effect, the teachers are on your side because that's going to guarantee it, right? And so, so much. I just want to thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we hope we'll continue these conversations. We'll hope we hear from you in the future. Um, we're happy to support you in your advocacy work. Um, so that brings us to the end of day one. And I just want to highlight a couple of things um, to look forward to for day two. Um, so we kick off tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern. Hopefully it's it's the same link. This is a recurring webinar. So the same link that you use today, you will use for all three days. Um, tomorrow, our focus is on educators and caregivers leading the way. We have six amazing educators, caregivers, parents, professionals um, that do amazing work. And you're just going to love being a part of this conversation. I'm super excited. Because we have so many panelists, I'm bringing in Keisha Reed, our Director of Communications and Outreach, um, to be my co-moderator so that we can have a lively discussion. Um, so we welcome you to join us. Um, I also want to touch on something that many of you might have heard of, but you might not have, but that is our current early childhood campaign that we are working on around um, uh, in defense of early childhood education and care and child development, kind of restoring the link between child development and high quality. So we at DEY receive emails from lots of you who are out there doing amazing work. And, and sometimes it's really discouraging because the emails are asking for help um, when you're being asked to do something that you know isn't correct, right? So um, we have a great second grade teacher in, in Delaware who reaches out a lot and is concerned because she sees what's happening in second grade as a direct result of like early childhood years. And so the concern about forcing children to sit still for long periods of time and knowing that's not true. And so she reaches out to us and ask for reports, guidance, support around this. And she's not the only one, right? We constantly hear that, you know, whether it's, um, the systems that are rating quality, that are not taking into account young children's development. Um, but there's just a lot out there, right? And so then we got together with Del Farron and her research, which I shared a link earlier, and it's also on the webpage that was just put in there about the campaign. But the research out of Tennessee, as I mentioned, is really telling us that academics doesn't belong in early childhood. And this focus on preschool um, is really going to harm children down the line because we're not focusing on child development, right? Yes, young children can 
learn, to read and to count, but there are a host of other skills that we need to be focusing on the early years, executive functioning, self-regulation, social and emotional skills that really come from a child-centered hands-on approach to, to the early years, right? So we got together and decided we were gonna launch this advocacy campaign. Um, you can go to our website and read more about it. I'm gonna share a little bit about it every day, but I just wanted to put that in there. If you haven't seen it, if you haven't signed on to our statement, we'll talk more about the statement tomorrow and what's next. Um, we, we held the town hall. Um, where we heard from some of you who are here in the audience about it. And we're, we're going to do more town halls and more webinars. And so we're looking for folks in their communities where if you have a legislator in particular and you have a particular issue around this that you feel you can gain traction on, uh, we want to work with you. We want to do that grassroots advocacy and what it looks like. Um, so we just want to put that out there. Um, so again, thank you all so much for joining us. And we will see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern for day two of the DEY 2023 Summer Institute.